So yeah, my name is Varya Dubinina, and uh, this is my second ever presentation, so please excuse my squeaks for air occasionally. Uh, today I would like to talk to you about some tips that we've discovered when making HTML5 games. Uh, tips on packing graphical assets, specifically. So, I work as an art director at the company called InBat Games, and we create casino-style games, such as slots and betting and the fortune wheel. Uh, and I want to begin by telling you about my first uh, assignment with which it pretty much all started for me. So, by the brief, I was supposed to make a fighting minigame for an existing slot, and I was really excited about that. Uh, it had to also be animated with two characters opposing each other, but no frame-by-frame -frame animations would be tolerated. And after hearing that, I went into a little bit of a shock, considering that Flash was no longer an option with its plugin automatically being blocked by most browsers. And after regaining my consciousness, I spent a while learning about all of the restrictions that already applied to our framework. And we had loads of those in place. So just from my choice of the platform, the game engine, and the libraries. For example, we use Pixie.js, and it doesn't go really well with uh, vector graphics, and it doesn't have a built-in 3D support. So we can't just render a 3D scene and uh, bake character mesh meshes. And there are many more specific restrictions that come to mind, and simply listing all would take ages. But all the engine-related restrictions fade compared to the main villain, the application size. Because the longer the game takes to load, the more chances there are for it to crash or for the player to change his mind and look for a faster game. The slot I was making was based on The Wizard of Oz uh, and actually ha had some assets prepared for me by an outsource art company. But they were pretty freaky, considering clear scenes of decapitation you can see going on everywhere. And uh, yeah, frame by frame, couldn't use that. So I wondered if I could somehow use those files to create a set of animations, making them look acceptable, and somehow avoiding the size problem. And I figured the best solution here would be implementing skeletal animation. So taking advantage of the skeletal technology allows you to create animations even if you're not a professional artist. Of course, it still takes loads of time and concentration to create complex movement, but still, much less than redrawing every frame would. So, the moving characters here are made of parts and driven by bones, and the sprite sheets can be tens or even hundreds of times smaller. Because, obviously, we only keep the parts, and all the animations are stored in a separate JSON file. Skeletal animation use, uses frame interpolation, so you can speed up and slow down your animations with no quality loss whatsoever. So, we have smaller sprite sheets, flexible FPS, and less artist man hours, because you don't have to redraw every frame. Awesome. So I've taken those old animations, a couple of frames from them, and I've cut them up into limbs and put together which is skeleton. So now I could make as many animations for her as I wanted. And it turned out that as soon as you got into this process of rigging and animating, you started to get really quick and you could just pretty much stamp them one after the other. And this is what the sprite sheets looked like in the end. So you can see the size is quite neat. Compared with the juicy fat armies of high quality FPS animation for one pose each. What a sight. I actually get Imperial March playing in my head every time I see this one. Didn't bother playing with compression for second numbers, I think you get the point. So we then applied the same process to existing games. This is the character animations from an Aladdin theme game, as you might have guessed, and it was already out and pretty popular. Here was, here is what the sprite sheet looked like before I laid my hands on it. It has already gone through some basic optimizations, such as reducing the FPS, trimming identical sprites, and basic compression. And this is what we made it into. So you can see size-wise, this makes a lot of difference. Here's a visual comparison of the old versus new animations. Not much difference. And that was the point, because uh, the players were already used to the low FPS quality, and I have to somehow keep that feel, so I used the motion graph function in Spine. Speaking of which, Spine 2D is by far my favorite skeletal software because of its comfy workspace and cool extra features. But there are loads of other choices in the market. 
uh, some of which are actually free of charge. I think it's important to remember about runtimes, because for us implementing Spine was really simple. There were already runtimes for Pixie.js on GitHub, but yeah, so we're only left with some tweaking and fine tuning, but if you're thinking of using Skeletal for your projects, you should definitely check out if your um, Skeletal animations are compatible with your framework, so the output files. However, obviously, uh, Skeletal animation is not Panacean. You have more draw calls on the GPU because of this flexible FPS function. You use more processor time uh, to calculate the changes in real time. And there are some concepts which are really hard or even impossible to create using a bone structure, such as, for example, special effects like water flowing or fire burning or even wing movement. So we have to look for different approaches. Spine actually advises we solve this problem by <coughs> inserting bits of frame by frame into the same bone slot. So, so far we've reduced the size of our large, heavily animated projects by about 30-40%. Let's move on and see if we can reduce that even further. In the next section, I, <coughs> I want to tell you about the production of a betting game based on racing from the movie Tron. So, as you already know, Pixie.js doesn't go really well with 3D, but outsource, our outsource concept designer at the time didn't know that. And he made us this demo with kind of cool 3D style background movement. And our bosses at the time, they loved it so much that we felt we just couldn't let them down. So we started thinking about ways to go around this issue. We made a list of all the methods we could think of to create this 3D movement. And we actually got around to trying each method and comparing them in the end. So this will be the boring numbers section. Please bear with me, don't go to sleep just yet. Frame by frame, a single frame at 1920 by 1080 res would weigh around 230 kilobytes. By using a JPEG optimizing utility, we compressed that down to 195.7 kilobytes. Now, if we kept to low 15 FPS, the resulting one second loop would weigh around 2.9 megabytes which is not so bad considering the large resolution needed for the backgrounds, but not quite good enough. So, moving to the next idea. Video. At 1920 by 1080 res, a three second video loop in MP4 would weigh around 660 kilobytes, which is a much better result. But let's see if we can beat that. What if we wrote a script that would generate and move the shapes in real time? Now we don't have to pack any assets for the background, just a script that's going to render 2 million pixels per frame, every frame, for, the rest of, for as long as it takes the player to notice that something's overloading his CPU big time and shuts the game down. Well, that sounds fun. But in reality, it turned out it's just too much for a mediocre mobile phone to handle, so We've cut down the original concept to simple horizontal lines sweeping up and down from an oscillating origin. Uh, and we also packed a static texture to show it the background. This reduced the strain on the CPU, but with no parallel computations, uh, it was still slowing the game down drastically. So then we have a texture of 557 kilobytes, which is nice, but there's still some strain on the CPU, which is not. And at this point, we could have stuck with video uh, as the best choice, but we decided to try a new approach using shaders. The Blick is actually shader generated. And we managed to achieve a much cooler result with very little extra effort. So we had one programmer work on this shader solution for two days including the testing phase, and that's considering he's never written a uh, shader before. It uses a minimal texture uh, and computes on the GPU, so it doesn't slow the application down at all. You know, it's interesting how there are so many beautiful examples of shader special effects on the net, but not many people consider using shaders for optimization. You can make tons of cool different special effects using shaders. 
Here we've used GLSL shaders to create an animation of uh, the searchlight movement. And we've actually connected the particle math to the movement of the searchlight, so it shows only when they hit them. And that's done really easily. You can also use shaders to create UI elements, like those loading spinners over here. Or to alter existing assets within your application. Here's a shader effect was used as a filter to create a new button state. If you're new to shaders, I suggest you check out Shader Toy. It's a website where you can create your own shaders from scratch and also see what people from all over the world are doing right now. So, what profit do we get from implementing shaders? We can create special effects close to photorealistic, so the water and fire reference here is solved. Turning to GPU, we get the benefits of parallel computations and hardware acceleration, which means very fast calculations. We also get the same flexibility as with procedural animation. So we can change real-time parameters uh, in response to the changes of other real-time parameters. And we need really little assets to use them. Shaders are compatible with most modern devices, but they also have their drawbacks. Probably the most important one relates to performance on mobile devices. The more pretty special effects you add, the more your FPS is going to go down. So you still have to be careful and not go overboard. So now our asset weight is further reduced, but considering the strain, uh, the performance, uh, the project can still be too overloaded at times. But there is a solution that will remove some excess strain, and that leads me to the next topic I want to share with you. We have created an extra stage during game initialization, which we call pre-render. Now, I know that term is often used for different operations, but it fits here perfectly, so we've kept the name. Pre-render allows us to unpack and edit graphical assets uh, that the application will then use. The process is similar to that uh, of the conveyor with the chain of uh, events, the chain of actions applied consecutive, consecutively to the textures from your sprite sheet. So during this pre-render phase, we can actually take our shader animations and bake them into consecutive textures. So this allows us to avoid the GPU strain during the game, but also keep the small amount of assets that need to be downloaded. Because obviously we can generate all the needed assets on the spot. As I've already mentioned, uh, we can use shaders to uh, generate all the needed button state graphics as well. So we only need to pack one clean state. You can see here uh, how an original clean texture can have shader effects applied to it one by one until the desired uh, effect is achieved, which, is then, uh, which then can be used by the application. You can argue that a couple of button states just don't weigh enough to go through this extra process of rendering, but we found that per one button we save 29 kilobytes of asset space, which is very pleasant when it comes to large UIs. We can also apply color filters to create numerous color variations for the same texture. And those can be both shader-based and uh, engine-based. So here we've used the standard PixieJS uh, color filter called Color Matrix. Now, let's have a look at some packing techniques. This one here is mirror packing. It's great uh, to optimize large symmetrical assets, such as backgrounds. So you can see uh, the texture is rotated and mirrored and glued during the pre-render to create the full texture. For those kinds, uh, mirror packing can reduce the original size uh, more than by half of your sprite sheets. For buttons, a special technique called image slicing can be used to further reduce the size. Uh, the method this method of compression allows us to remove all the repeating sections, leaving only the sides and a small slice of the middle. This is the process of unpacking such a button carried out by the pre-render module. Another cool method for packing simple buttons is called nine slice. So here we cut the button into nine sections, from which only the corners remain unchanged, but all the other sections are stretched accordingly. Here's another compression method that we came up with for circular sets. We like to call it the pizza slice method. As you can see, we only keep the one slice of the pizza 
and it is then copied and rotated around the center to create the full texture. And as you remember, we can always apply the color filter to create a wide range of differently colored objects from the same texture. So we do have some cons and pros for this approach. It takes time to gener generate the modified assets, so obviously you add extra time to game initialization. And if you don't organize your pre-render correctly, you'll be faced with accumulation of excess textures in the GPU buffer and a massive increase in number of draw calls. Also, your visual designer has to have a solid understanding of the methods of optimization to prepare the assets accordingly. But then again, less assets need to be downloaded from the web. You have no restrictions to a spe specific framework or API. The pre-render can be created anywhere. And uh, its function set is only limited by your imagination as a developer. So let's, do let's draw some conclusions. This red stripe over here, the loading process, it's the critical zone where your assets get downloaded from the net. If your connection flickers during the asset loading, there's a huge chance that your game will crash. But if the same thing happens during the pre-render stage, then you just continue, con continue the initialization until the connection is restored. You can then play the game. So by optimizing our assets using all the above methods and adding this extra stage of pre-render, we managed to um, minimize the resources size and cut this red zone down in half. We do get an extra zone of pre-rendering, but our overall loading process is still around 40% faster than before. So by all means, add extra content, but don't forget about asset optimization. So my presentation was meant to be 20 minutes, but I think we have some extra time. So I'll tell you about another little trick uh, with a particle system. So this will be an extra bonus tip. Here's a story of how we tricked our integrated particle system. At the very end of the Land of Oz game production, we realized that its free game section wasn't very rewarding visually. We had to add something quickly to make it uh, look more fun and exciting for the lucky gamer. And well, what can be similar and yet more exciting than butterflies? Colorful, fast moving, they attract just enough attention and they also fit the style of the game perfectly. I've decided to create a particle system so I could have loads of them flying around the screen and use multiple frames for wing movement. We had a built-in particle system in our game engine, but it was really basic. Uh, and it would allow for frame changes and either constant speed or constant acceleration for both X and Y on each particle. No changes in speed or direction and no fluttering up and down for our butterflies carelessly. It looked weird and we didn't have time to rewrite the module. But there was a solution and it was simple. It involved a new approach to texture packing. We figured that if we copy the butterflies' images and move them up and down a certain amount and then pack the results, most texture packing programs would automatically trim transparent pixels and remove identical sprites, keeping only the position data and leaving us with <coughs> one sprite per each wing position, so six in total here. Using this feature, we can create extra movement by moving the, the images uh, inside the frame and also vary the speed of wing movement by adding duplicate frames in between. And the sprite sheet doesn't change at all. So the whole point here is that from the very beginning, game dev has emerged from the world of restrictions. From the oldest consoles and computers, which we now rightly call calculators, and it has thrived on them ever since, uh, evolving with new solutions, many of which would never have emerge, emerged if it wasn't for the troubles that caused developers to look for new approaches. It doesn't matter what kind of a developer you are. Don't let the restrictions you face restrict your creativity. There's always a way out. Sometimes you just need to reach outside of what you know and grab it by the tail. Thank you.